get, get right ahead. We're starting a little bit early, a minute early, and we have time for introductions. I'm going to introduce myself. I am Guillermo Rauch, the CEO and founder of Vercel, the company behind Next.js. I think it's interesting that I'm here today because we provide a serverless deployment platform for front-end applications. Uh, and I think it's funny that uh, you know that behind serverless, there's always servers. So it's proper that I'm here being surrounded by the greatest minds in the Kubernetes world, the folks that are creating the foundational layers of the cloud, the basic infrastructure on top of which we create the most exciting and the most developer-friendly platforms in the world. So I want to go right ahead and uh, help these folks introduce themselves. Please go ahead. My name is Tom Manville. Can you hear me? My name is Tom. I lead the engineering team for Kasten by Veeam, where we do data protection and application mobility for Kubernetes applications. Um, I'm really excited to share my experience here today. So um, as a startup, we found it in 2017, and we were relatively early in the Kubernetes lifecycle. Um, and when we started, in fact, I would say that stateful applications were uh, you know, very foreign to Kubernetes, right? It was mostly a stateless, sorry, stateful were foreign, and it was mostly a stateful, pl uh, stateless platform. Um, so I'm excited to share my experience coming from a very small startup in the space and eventually growing to, uh, growing, going through the growth motions and becoming uh, successfully acquired by, by Beam, our new parent company. Um, and I hope that's helpful for all of you. Hi, I'm Kelsey Hightower. I'm currently learning Kubernetes, so please be kind. <laughs> and uh, I advise a lot of the companies that are going from uh, community to customer, and so hopefully we can share a little of that insight today. Thank you, Kelsey. This is a, I'm Shen Liang. I'm one of the co-founders and CEO uh, of Acorn Labs. Uh, we, have a, we have an exhibit booth out there. We're a new company. And earlier, I started a company called Rancher Labs, and they have a business uh, booth here as well. So check us out. Hi, I'm Liz Rice. I am Chief Open Source Officer at a company called Isovalent, which was the original creator of the Cilium project. And we donated Cilium to the CNCF. And we get a lot of questions about, well, how does the business model work? Why did you contribute your project? How can we also be successful in the cloud native ecosystem? And uh, I hope that I'll be able to share a little bit of that with you today. Perfect. And we have that experience uh, uh, ourselves as well because we built Next.js, which is open source. I like to call it the Kubernetes of the front end world. It builds on top of React. And we built a platform on top that's cloud native. And it's a business on top of the open source project. So uh, Kelsey has been an advisor to our company. And this is a topic that I'm really passionate about. So if folks want to find me after the session and um, ask me you know, what are, what are some of the best practices of, of building this kind of business, I can uh, help elaborate further. So without further ado, I think, when I first got started using Kubernetes many years ago, I think part of what drove this excitement was there's an open standard. There's a, there's something that folks are converging around. Everything is open source. I can run a database on top of it. I can run my workers on top of it. I can run my servers on top of it. But over time, folks have also started to realize that managing all of that responsibility is tricky. You have to run a business, right? So where does open source start and end? Um, how do we help companies get more efficient with their uh, Kubernetes use? And, and what are some of your thoughts? I think um, one of the things that you need to do if you're building a business on open source is figure out what the value you add as a business. You know, the value that you're create, you've given away the software. That the software is not the thing that you're selling per se. You might have some other features, some enterprise features, or it might be support, or it might be kind of expertise, it might be training. There could be all sorts of ways that you're adding value, but you kind of have to be realistic about thinking, what will people pay money for if we give the software away? You have to have that in mind when you're building a business. Would you agree? I mean, yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I learned uh, very early on when I was doing a, a company a long time ago, open source company called Cloud Cloud.com, and I asked the great um, uh, Jim Whitehurst at the time. He he was like uh, pretty new in his 
Korea at Red Hat, and I always I was just quite surprised how Red Hat could build such a big business, you know, open source business. And and I remember at the time he he told me something I still remember today. He's like, don't think of us as a support business. We people really buy Red Hat because that's the only place they can get certified with you know these these important applications like Oracle and SAP. Then I realized, wow, this is this is this is very very different from. From from what I was uh, what I had in mind, and I think that more than anything else uh, uh, influenced uh, everything uh, I've done in terms of you know creating businesses from open source technology ever since. You just gotta have something that you do to supply unique value to customers beyond open source. Um, working with a lot of startups, if you've been in the product space and software. VCs used to say this, and they some still say this, you gotta stay away from the pro services because it doesn't scale. And so a lot of companies try to go with this product-led approach. So if your product is really strong, then you're fine, especially in the world where there are no service providers to compete with. You download the product, and the first thing you need is support, or that could be the way you do it. But these days, it's very different. If you come up with a successful open source project, You've done a lot of the hard work in finding product market fit. You can tell by some of those GitHub stars and those conference talks. And so you've cleared the path that this idea is worth implementing. You have the perfect free trial and it works. But the problem is you're competing with service providers. Sometimes we call them cloud providers, but that isn't the only option. The very first time I seen the big shift in the business model of open source, a big one recently, um, I think Vercel is a great example. If you use Next.js, Vercel is very clear about what you should pay for. It's one thing to build a website, but the whole point is to get it in front of people to use. So it's very clear what the uplift is from there. But the other one that I want you to hold in your minds is what happened with Let's Encrypt. It's probably the first open source project I've ever interacted with that I've never downloaded on my own machine before. It comes out and it challenges this industry that was charging people hundreds of dollars for an SSL certificate. Not only did they come up with a protocol to automate the renewal process, they immediately gave you something, in many ways, to pay for. You can just use it right away and the adoption curve is gone. So there was no way that anyone else could beat them to the service piece. No matter what anyone says, this still is a service business. So you gotta give people something to pay for. And I believe it is still service, you just want them to do it with your protocol. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And we get a lot of questions kind of on product-led growth versus sales-led growth. Um, you know, my opinion for a successful large company, you probably need both. Um, and we've seen that otherwise large companies wouldn't be investing massively into sales teams and only focus on product-led growth. Um, I would say anecdotally for us, our kind of magic moment was when we hired a great sales team. Um, you know, I think we were a team of engineers, engineering background, right? And uh, we were very focused on product-led growth and it turned out that our secret sauce was really hiring a good sales team. Um, so it's kind of a mix. Um, but yeah, you know, the, the space is pretty, uh, there's a lot of components in the space. If you look at the CNCF landscape, there's so many projects. Um, and so it's very hard to differentiate yourself. And I think when you think of what customer environments look like, you really want to understand their infrastructure and how they're, they're adopting and using open source. And as, as Liz said, I think the value you add on top, that's really important because they are getting a lot of value just from these existing projects and infrastructure. So what really figuring out what your strategy on top of that is kind of the important part. Can I add, I want to add context to the sales team. I've worked at open source companies when they're early and they try to hire a VP of sales too early. And it's hard. The best sales reps bring a Rolodex. They know what these customers have because they sold it to them. And when they join this new company, they have this level of insight into what they sold to them before. They know who the top level team is and they know who has hands on the keyboard. So they know who to talk to. But the most important component to that, you got to give them something to sell. So when the narrative is clear, when the story is clear, that sales rep can say, ooh, those are all the gaps in the previous product. I know what I'm selling now, and I know who to sell it to. And I think you got to have that to make sure that if you're going to bring in a sales team, they have something to do. Yeah, I think that dovetails really well into this question of differentiation. What do you bring to the table? What works, what doesn't work when you're building a business in, in this space? You called out... People come to us because are, we're the experts in Next.js, we're the experts in React, and we provide a clear service on top of that. 
that provides some scalability benefits, some collaboration benefits, some workload benefit, workflow benefits. So what are things that you would recommend these emerging businesses do? You mentioned, for example, not putting the cart before the horse, not, not trying to start selling because you, before you have a product that actually works. What are things that you would recommend these businesses do? I'll, I'll, I'll start then. I mean, I actually have a honestly a slightly uh, a different uh, different opinion. Uh, you know, these days it's actually quite fashionable. It didn't used to be like this. Like a lot of the open source companies are worried about, you know, how to how to keep something back. I mean, I think Open Core now is a positive has positive connotation now versus negative, and uh, you know, AGPL or these these things are back because it's sort of okay to be hostile to. To, to cloud providers because they're the, they're the evil guys but I, I I think I think I I don't know I, I I still think it's it's a lot of these I mean I look at a lot of startups and they're kind of doing this I mean they you know you look at their github project has like 200 stars and uh, you know really nobody even cares what they're doing I I, I feel like companies um, I mean you look at you know companies who successful companies who had to do stuff like this they are like MongoDBs and their last day I mean they were already really a public they were already a public company before they got into you know trouble with Amazon so so it's it just feel like you know it, this is this is sort of a rich man's problem you know don't I, don't try to do it too early before I think you get I think what you're calling out is you gotta go beyond github stars <laughs> you don't just browse github you know, get content with just stars. There has to be more substance beyond that. But I think it's a really great point that that kind of community engagement, you know, if you're going to build on open source, you've got to have something that people care about. And then if you're the company that has the expertise, you know, let's say a financial institution wants to use what you're doing. A, they want somebody on the phone when something goes wrong. And B, they probably have enterprise requirements that you know, your your fan base, your community don't necessarily care about, but the people who want to pay money have specific requirements and they need experts to implement those requirements. So I think having a product or a, a project rather that a community can really fall in love with, but knowing that your company is where the experts are is a really great foundation. And it also enables you to have those conversations about, well, what are the paid for features that you know, I, I pick financial institution because obviously they're people who typically have money, but whatever verticals or a pharmaceutical or media or whatever, they're going to have some specific requirements and they want to talk to you about those requirements. I love that. I would add having a point of view, right? So folks come to you for your expertise and your point of view in the market. You could be going after observability. You know, it seems like a crowded market, but if you bring a novel point of view and address a big pain, you have that. The other thing that you mentioned that I love is enterprises love optionality and risk mitigation. So being open source first is great for that. You know, you, if, if we do a, a good job with Next.js and, and, and serving it to a global audience, great. If we don't, you take your Next.js workload somewhere else. And that's what's kind of the fire behind this engine. Yeah, you know, I think we're kind of in a different market a little bit here where the, the requirements are, are changing pretty significantly. But, you know, what, what would let you raise funding in the past has definitely changed. And I think just having pure, you know, GitHub stars, for example, was probably sufficient uh, when we started. 21. Uh, yeah. <laughs> probably, yeah. Um, and now, now there's a lot more focus on actually the, the revenue side of things. Um, and so it's important to try to figure out how to map a little bit, that, map to that a little bit sooner. Um, I don't think you have to actually be different because that's not the only way people choose to do business. Uh, if you think about Ryan Reynolds, if you've ever seen some of his movies, but this actor gets into the mobile phone service business, the most commoditized thing in the world. And this person created a relationship with his audience base. I mean, no one thought of doing anything close to this. Maybe the CEO of T-Mobile at the time with his uncarrier campaign. So in the sea of commodity, because in open source, you start as a commodity, which is a really interesting place to begin. So Ryan Riddles gets into the mobile business and he makes these epic commercials. They're not the best commercials on purpose, but you watch them anyway. And I remember my daughter telling me, she's like, hey, we signed up for this new service. I actually left Mint Mobile to another carrier. And she said, I can hear Ryan Reynolds in my head apologizing 
for the lack of quality service. And I knew that he had did something super special. There's an old saying about business that most people do business with people they like and trust. That creates a whole new definition of loyalty that even if a competitor comes out, I will just wait. Red Hat may not always be in the forefront of technology, but I'll wait until they turn that software into an RPM and I'll use it then. So I think there's this other element and I see it and you're one of those founders that is out there. Mitchell Hashimoto is one of those founders that was out there. And I guarantee you, a lot of you all became customers after meeting those people who work on the project. And then you became loyal to that project. And many times, a lot of this stuff is becoming parts of our identities. I met a guy today and I never thought I would see it happen. He had a Kubernetes tattoo on his arm. That ain't coming off. Where are you? Raise your hand. <laughs> And so I think now we have to appeal, and this gets into the marketing side, you're actually now talking directly to the customer. And you can't just hide behind the product and hope marketing will take you there. You actually have to jump out and do that same technique. I love this. I'm picturing myself as Ryan Reynolds now. <laughs> Thank you. But I, when you were saying that about building a brand and building that authentic connection with the community, I immediately thought Hashi before he mentioned them because they, they are in crowded spaces. You know, you, you have a vault, but there are other vaults. You, know, you have Terraform, there are other infrastructure as code solutions, but there's only one that speaks to me the way that they speak to me with their brand, with their, the way that I think about their technical solutions, the way I think the transparency of the company and so on. So I think that's, a, that's an excellent point. You mentioned marketing. So how do you, what are best practices around that? Like, how do you market? How do you, how do you produce consistent signal with that audience in ways that scale, are authentic, and help build a business? I think this is where, this is where I think engineers always get it wrong. You have a successful technical product. You're popular. Lots of people are talking about it. You're getting free people talking about it at meetups and conferences, and you think you've solved it. You think you're ready now to go from tech to product, and it's a very different thing. Um, so I think the biggest challenge is that as an engineer, you are still required to do the business part. When you get in a room full of executives that are paying for 500 other products, yours is, isn't as important as you think. It's one of 500. Actually, I don't even have time to talk to you about it. Can you just sell to the Amazon marketplace so I can pay for it once and move on? So if you're gonna be in front of an executive, you gotta learn, I think engineers are really good at the hello world stuff, right? You get next to your peer, you say, hey, I wanna show you my project, and they get excited. But now you gotta to turn to an executive and say, hello revenue, slightly different conversation. And a lot of people can't make that pivot. And so yes, now you're talking to a customer that says, we have learned not to trust marketing. No one trusts the blog posts because it's too positive. It doesn't have the actual day two and day three things you're gonna run into. So who do we turn to? We turn to the community. We turn to the person that doesn't work at that company and we want their authentic opinion. And when that founder or those maintainers can establish that trust, then I will listen to you. So I think that pivot is what all of those technical people end up having to make. I'm gonna be honest, some of y'all are just getting lucky. Some of these companies are literally just getting lucky. They actually do not know how to do this because they can't repeat it. You come up with a product, maybe the logo is nice, but it turns out your marketing department is the community. They actually do the heavy lifting for you. They start the meetups. They tell the story better than anyone that works at your company does. And you confuse that for having a great marketing strategy. You don't have a marketing strategy, you're lucky. And when that community shows up, you better figure out a way to appreciate them and never get confused of where that growth engine is coming from because when they leave, you will find out just how naked you are when the tide goes down. Yeah, completely agree. And um, I think another thing that engineers tend to get wrong is they tend to talk about the solution first. So, um, you know, I've written this great thing and look at what it does, which is great for a certain a group of people, but at some point you have to start saying, what are the problems that I solve? And you, you still have to do that in an authentic way. And yeah, ideally your community will talk about the problems that they've solved with your solution. But I think particularly for those of us who come from an engineering background, it's so easy to kind of 
have that conversation the wrong way around. And you have to think about why should anybody care about this solution? And if all you're talking about is features, they, they don't necessarily care. They have to identify with the problem that it solves first before they care about what it does to solve those problems. I'm gonna add one quick thing there. You have to remind people of what the problem was. There are a lot of people who are okay brute forcing the current part of their stack. They've forgotten the problem so much that they just brute force it. If you remember any of the talks that I was doing in the early days of Kubernetes, I was always careful to remind people Here's what your puppet setup looks like. You meet people where they are, and then you show them what's next. I love that. I always remind our teams that we're constantly reintroducing ourselves. I think folks think that there is this global context that everyone remembers every brand, every one of those 500 vendors. I think you have to like ignite a little bit of that context switch and give them a piece to hold on to so that folks can remember who you are. The other thing that I love is the community becomes part of your marketing team legitimately, and you have to invest and reward that. So it reminded me a couple conferences ago, it was Next.js Conf, a member of our community who at the time didn't have a ton of followers, who's just a very smart, motivated individual, he did a better job than our team at summarizing what we launched. He created this beautiful tweet storm saying, here's what Vercel launched. So what I did right after is I took his tweet and I pinned it to my profile. How did I do that? Twitter used to have a bug where you could pin someone else's tweets. But to me, that was the reward of our community is doing such a great job. Let's reward them. Let's motivate them. Let's give them resources uh, to do more in the future. So. I, I totally agree with those points, and I think I wish I had this advice when we were going through the process. You know, we fell into all these traps. Um, I think when we were first kind of getting started and in investing a lot in these conferences and talking to people, uh, we had to reintroduce ourselves every time, and we would only go into these the features specifically. Right? We talk about we can do this, you know, backup faster than anyone else, do do all these uh, features around using volumes and things. Um, but most conversations were, oh, what do you do? You know, and I, I think our material and our discussions. Um, really were a lot more impactful when we simplified and focused. And as an engineer, you know, I, I see a lot of people fall in this trap even on the engineering side. And for me, I, I like to try to map our failures on other sides to, to the marketing side and the business side. And really focusing on simplicity was really important for us. What do you do? <laughs> That's a perennial question. Like hacker news threads, you always see like folks are saying like, they get really frustrated. I, go, I went to your homepage. I still don't know what do you do. So I love that you called it out. What do you do? You have to keep working on that. What do you do? What do you do? What do you do? And, and, and make it clear and, and, and crisp. Um, so moving forward, like leapfrogging, um, there, there are a lot of changes happening to the ecosystem. The best practices are always shifting. What are some of the opportunities that you all see that are gaps? Maybe because the right open source technology is not there, the right managed solution is not there. What are gaps in the ecosystem that become opportunities for these new businesses and startups? You know, one thing we see a lot with our customers, I think, is uh, there's a lot of people have really chosen every single permutation of every cloud native project you can possibly imagine. And uh, I think having the ability to still integrate with that type of infrastructure when we sell to these customers is really important. Um, like I said, making it as simple as possible, but still recognizing the fact that when you deal with these customers, especially people who are hitting web scale type deployments, um, making sure that you can still understand if you'll even work in their environment, making it easy for your, your SEs and your sales folks to go and, and qualify customers is really important. Yeah, I mean, there's that phrase, and I use it all the time, it's easy to predict the future when you're working on it. All the products that you see, especially like managed services, they're like 80% solutions. Why? Mainly because cloud providers don't have permission to be super opinionated because you cannot get mass adoption of something that is perfect, it's only gonna be perfect for a fraction of the customer base. And so what happens is, and I think what the role is, is that those gray areas is where the opportunity is. That opportunity can evaporate, so you gotta pay attention consistently, but when these things launch and you find when they hit that 80%, that's when you come in. And when you come in, you fill that gray area with an opinionated approach. Because at that point, people don't want another generic thing because you even commoditize yourself even further. So when you say, hey, AppEngine is great, and you can definitely build a static site on it, 
but then you can go get opinionated and says, this is how you actually do it. And we're going to serialize that idea into the actual framework. It's risky because if no one agrees, then you lose. But if people agree, then you actually have a very unique market. I can think about Volt as a good example or Terraform as a great example. Every cloud provider has a native configuration management thing for their cloud. But Terraform and HashiCorp come with this very opinionated view on how it should work. HCL, module systems and plugins. And it fills this gray area so much that even some cloud providers have backed away from even managing their own system in favor of the one that's now the universal standard. So find the gray areas and there is going to be a market of people that are frustrated with the limitations of that and that's your solution space. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I like uh, you know, I like to add something here. I agree with everything that everyone said, but you know, I get asked a lot, like, like, where do you get the idea? What are the ideas? Which is what what was asked. And uh, I mean, really, the answer to that is for me is always uh, the the ideas are really diamond dozen. They're out there everywhere. But the question is, you know, how do you ever get an opportunity to exploit it? And, and really, the, 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 the pretty much the only way, there are a couple of ways to get there, but the most common way I've seen is folks just, just go an extra mile, do whatever they're doing really well. Then inevitably, you get into constraints about your current product or the current organization, or you're in a big company and, and, and big companies somehow can't fund or can't, can't, can't reorient toward this area. Then, then, then you figure out, okay, this, this does make sense and that motivates you to create a new open source project or then create a new company, right? So another thing that I've seen, uh, I've experienced myself repeatedly is a uh, uh, because of because technology is evolving so quickly, and a lot of times it's hard to like go go up against you know an Amazon try to recreate their cloud or go up against Microsoft try to recreate their OS or but 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 then uh, what, what what happens is a lot of the users a lot of the smart users they just realize you know I'm not only I'm not really using all of it anyway so so a lot of the inside I find even though it's not a product you worked on personally but it's a product you personally you intimately use and and then then you gain insight and 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 and, and that opens a whole lot of doors but 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 in two both of these cases it is it is the, the insight is really based on depth and uh, and and expertise right and and there's just no substitute for that I have been involved in my fair share of businesses that had really lovely technical ideas but were a disaster from a business point of view um, because I think we were creating nice technology rather than really making sure that it was a problem, that it was a pain point, that it was something people would pay for. People don't pay for like nice to have. They, they have, you have to, you know, save them money, solve a real problem, make something significantly faster. You know, we have a whole sponsor showcase floor full of people who do that, who have identified ways of solving pain points. But I think that was something that was quite a hard lesson for me that, yeah, just because it's a great technical idea does not mean that it's something people will pay for. And that's what you need. To, you need to have that conversation to work out that it is a pain point. There's the other part, too, where they may not want to buy it from you, which is a hard pill to swallow if you're the person that created the project, the steward behind the project, but they choose to give it to a, another service provider who either implements or runs the same service you've created. So that's the reality. You're not guaranteed to win just because you are the maintainer of the project. And I think a lot of people are surprised by that, that someone just out executes them, not having any of the other things you have other than an easier billing model or the ability to bundle what you do behind a larger project. So keep in mind that this game is very complex. I wanted to emphasize Kelsey's earlier insight that you need to bring an opinionated solute. You need to address that 20%. There is a lot of value in trying to discover how significant that 20% is. It happened to us in the early days. I was obsessed with that idea of the instant deployment to the cloud. But what really helped us succeed was narrowing down to the space of front-end deployment. As an engineer, I love to generalize. You could argue that before ChatGPT existed, we're paid to generalize and create abstractions 
and reusable utilities and functions. And, and what I realized is that the general compute, the general cloud service belongs to the cloud providers. It's very hard to compete on being the best general solution. But when you bring that opinion and that specialization, it's actually really easy to compete because you look at the general thing and you're like, no, I want the best thing for this problem. And it tends to be the more opinionated solution. So um, that's a pretty awesome insight. Um, speaking of things that enterprises buy, so what are your thoughts on security, um, disaster recovery? What are, the, what are the features that you would select as those uh, must-haves that could lead to business opportunities, especially since enterprises are so security sensitive? Uh, add Active Directory support. <laughs> You're going to get your check easily from that one. I would just say one, maybe you didn't ask this question, but the thing not to spend too much time on, I see a lot of people make this mistake. The, that little dashboard with metrics on it, nobody want to log in and see that. Some people have like a solution for logging and you have your engineers spend a whole year creating this beautiful observability portal just for logs. And the enterprise is like, dude, we have Grafana with thousands of dashboards for all of our products. I do not want to log into your little app just to see metrics about logs. Your first feature should be integrating with Datadog or some other thing and spend your time doing something only your team can do. So that's one of those things where I think people believe the enterprise wants a single pane of glass because your marketing department copied that from Cisco's website. That is not the thing people are typically looking for. They're looking for something that fills the gray area. They already have the general thing. So you building more general things in your product instead of unique features that the other thing doesn't have. So I would say, I know you didn't ask that question, but do not specifically spend too much time. It's good for demos, but it ain't gonna sell you a bunch of licenses to your software. Integration. Yeah, I know there's lots of things that enterprises definitely want here. Um, for me, the, the strategy we took, I think, was, and again, you know, when we released our product, we, we followed the advice, be embarrassed by your, your MVP. I was very embarrassed, so please don't look up any demos of me giving you know, demos of our first product. But I think for, on the enterprise side, you know, we had success there because we really ended up getting a lot of rejections. People were saying no to us all the time, because, but we, in that process, we figured out what people needed. And I think I had a lot less intuition on what really made enterprise software successful, especially because for us, you know, we're in this kind of convergence of view things where you have cloud native software, open source software, really getting into enterprises. And it's kind of a unique situation where you need these enterprise type features. Um, authorization authentication is huge. I mean, you know, this is something you need very fine grained permissions and the ability to specify all this stuff. Um, but for me, it was really a learning lesson of, you know, just talking to these enterprises, understanding what they need, because I had a very poor intuition on exactly what they needed until I just sat down with them and spent a lot of time got a lot of rejections and ended up um, being more successful that way. Yeah, just, just real quickly, you know, there's, there's a lot of open source projects that are very, very popular. They serve developers and stuff, but there's just no business around it. You look at it and you know nobody's going to pay any money for this. And then there, there are other popular projects like Kubernetes that a lot of companies built successful business, right? But one thing I've seen is, uh, you know, some of the uh, projects or the project you're going to create, if it's going to be more uh, appealing to, to enterprise to pay money, tend to have to play some sort of a mission critical role. I mean, that's why, you know, Active Directory, Security, Backup, Restore, HA, tend to, t uh, Certification, FIPS, you know, th those are sort of things that might be boring, but, but that they, they're gonna really pay the bills and it's gonna build a billion dollar business. Yeah, in, in the security space, there's uh, a lot of, kind of um, standardized behaviors and things that are expected, particularly from, from enterprise security teams. And that's the problem. You, you know, you have to meet people where they are. And if you're trying to build security solutions, you, you can't necessarily take people away from the checkboxes that they have to continue to tick, even if you've got something that you know is technically superior and solves it in a completely different way, you've got to meet them with, you know, comply with their compliance checklists. So security can be a really difficult space to innovate in, in a way that still meets people's day to day. You know, you can have a great conversation where people go, that's really clever. I love that idea. We'll do that. 
after we figure out how to do all the upgrades and CVEs and, you know, deal with our backlog of CVE mitigations that we need to deal with. So meeting people where they are. There's something that I think Kubernetes did masterfully that we don't talk about from a business perspective. No one really sold Kubernetes and made money. Like here's this open source Kubernetes, call me for support. That didn't happen. Kubernetes left a ton of gray area. And what you pay for is the integration that VMware has in the form of Tanzu or GKE in the form of Google Cloud's integration. You pay for the integration work. And some open source projects start to learn early on that ecosystem part is critical because yes, it's hard to be that general thing, but what happens when you're Prometheus and every other provider in the world adopts the Prometheus protocol? This is not a guarantee for success, but it's a guarantee to be invited to the table to have a discussion. And sometimes success for a lot of these projects, let's be honest, every one of these projects are not gonna IPO. So creating an ecosystem may be the best way to be a quieter by one of these people that now depend on this. So open telemetry, Kubernetes, Envoy, all of these things recreate ecosystems, mainly because they're open and their APIs are plentiful and they're not trying to hide everything behind a locked box or a proprietary API. So ecosystem is a very masterful way of definitely becoming to grow a new market. That is hard to do, so I'm not saying it's a general solution, but go back and study the newer businesses that have been built around ecosystems, and you can maybe be able to play this game for a long time. In a nutshell, we all have to integrate together and that will increase the collective chance of our success. I think Kelsey also mentioned, or sort of passed by, the idea of managed services, which again, you know, operating systems, it's one thing to build a really great project, it's a whole other thing to actually deploy it, not just deploy it on day zero, but keep deploying it day after day. So managed systems is another huge value add that a lot of businesses out there are, are, are doing and, and building businesses on. It's probably the most common open source model right now. All right. I want to thank you all for attending the session and all our wonderful panels. I learned a lot today, so please stay connected and uh, reach, reach out to us for more questions. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.